Okay, we are ready to go live, going live now. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Mumika, for support. So, oh, and I forget the most important thing to share on my screen. <laughs> awesome. Good. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the final part of our bootcamp, uh, bringing machine learning model into production. So today is the wonderful day because today is the time to present the capstone results. So let's take a look of what is expecting, what is waiting for us today. I'll start with a brief description of the capstone energy use case. Then we'll move to a brief presentation of the mentors without whom this uh, project was not possible. Then we move to the participants' presentations, and these are the most important part, because without the presenters, without the participants of the bootcamp, there is no way to do it, right? And then we finalize with some Q&A. Uh, some basic rules as you're watching the stream. If you have any questions, feel free to drop all these questions in the chat. We will have some time at the end of all presentations to go through the questions. And if the question's too big, we can just um, answer them on Slack later. So let's start without further ado. So our capstone energy use case. To make this a success, to make this a real use case, we decided to collaborate together with an awesome uh, net Dutch startup, uh, Dexter. And uh, we decided to work on the new future of energy consumption when the old scenario was to understand what are the energy demand for now and then just adjust energy generation using fossil fuels. And the new approach is to use actually alternative source of the energy. But the issue with this, though, that sometimes um, it's really hard to store all the generated energy and on top of it, to know exactly how much energy could be generated by wind and how much energy could be generated by solar panels, it's really hard to do. So our new approach will be how we can adjust our energy consumption to make sure that the amount of available electricity is enough for our use. So for this use case, we started to work with a pie town that located in the north of the Netherlands, and that's a self-sufficient town they cut off uh, some time ago from the electricity grid. It means that they're just using alternative energy sources. From one side, it's nice. Uh, it's the first step into the future. From another side, the Pi Town has an issue because they have a lot of blackouts when the people return from work, start charging their devices, and that's where the blackouts happen. So the task for our participants was actually to create um, it sounds like easy, just create a dashboard that's going to show how much energy is allowed to use for the participants. But underneath, there are a lot of work. And that's exactly where the work of our presenters was focused on. So we were working on an energy uh, demand uh, forecast model. And then we're going to compare this with the forecast for the wind and solar energy. And based on that, make calculations and give recommendation to the people of the Pi Town, uh, or they can use as much electricity as they want to, as just go, or if they want to slow down a little bit and just use and less electricity. So, for example, wait for a wash disher to start, and the let's say the least um, interesting option, but sometimes we need to adhere to it, is just charge only essential devices. For example, like you can stop fridge from charging, right? But for the rest of the, of the devices, like charging up your car, it can wait. So there was two steps. One step was uh, de develop a solution to prevent power blackouts uh, when uh, they know at least um, what can they can do during the week. And the second step was to add more granularity to it and to show them next 15 minutes what they can do. So we really, really thankful for the whole Dexter team uh, to working on this case and providing this case to us, and especially for two members of Dexter, for Inge and for Martia. Thank you so much. And now it's time for the mentors part. As I mentioned before, without mentors, it was really hard to be here together with so many people. So a huge round of virtual applause for our mentors. It's Lini Jose, 
Uh, she's a machine learning engineer at H&M and Sweden. Filip Vancevski, machine learning engineer from LinkedIn, the Netherlands. Demi Dundas, product manager analytics at MessageBird, the Netherlands. Carolina Londono, data engineer at FedEx, the Netherlands. Lucas Sturtewagen, data engineer at LinkedIn, the Netherlands. Hina Han, she's a scientific researcher at Erasmus University Medical Center. And she was the person who spent a lot of time during her PhD for smart grid energy optimization. And Matthijs Brouwers. But I think now Matthijs can just introduce himself. So Matthijs, yeah. go on. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Matthijs. And uh, as you see, I'm, I'm the CTO uh, slash head of learning and development at a company called Accelerated. Um, we're a consultancy firm based in Amsterdam. And we actually focus on helping companies grow their internal teams. So essentially what we do, we, um, we get data scientists and engineers and cloud engineers with uh, a bit of experience and we train them further uh, in their relevant domain. They stay with us for a year and then at the end of the year, hopefully we uh, have a nice client or we have a client for them that they like and they, they want to continue just for that client to work internally there. Okay. Um, Matthijs, yeah. one second. Sorry for, inter for interruption. No, no worries. I will really, um, it will be really good if you start sharing your screen. Oh, you sure. Prepare something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's basically the same slide. So, uh, okay. but just to make no, sure no worries there. Um, right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Uh, right. We're hiring. So, if you feel like that's something that you might enjoy, uh, ping me afterwards. Uh, always happy to discuss. Uh, my role there is basically to guide every of our consultants through their technical development. That means that I develop a lot of training material, uh, partially on MLOps and, and machine learning engineering as well, uh, which is also why I was interested in mentoring for this, uh, for this bootcamp. It's always fun to see how others solve these issues, what, what issues are people are facing and, and see if I can help there or change or just learn a bit more myself as well. In my spare time, I still like to be active with data and data science and data engineering. So I'm, I'm co-chair of PyData Amsterdam meetup and conference. And I was the vice chair of PyData Global last year. And I maintain some open open source software such as Scikit Lego and Time Series. That's me in a nutshell. Cool. And just probably two words about Scikit Lego and Time oh. Series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Scikit Lego is um so if you well, uh, if you know Scikit-Learn, there's a whole bunch of components in the library, but there's also a lot of things that you might imagine that you want to do that are not in the library. And together with some colleagues, we found ourselves rewriting the same things with clients over and over again. And we thought, you know what? There's probably others with the same issue. Let's make a, a toolkit out of them. So there's all these Lego blocks um, that you can add to your Scikit-Learn pipelines to make them do different things than what the Scikit-Learn maintainers themselves had in mind when they developed the library. Um, time series is quite a bit different. Time series is based on uh, Facebook's profit model. So it's a, oh, a Bayesian okay. time series model. And one of the issues that I had with that model is that, well, it's not very open to do slightly different things than what the maintainers thought of. And also it's not very good at estimating different related time series. So basically I rewrote the entire thing in PyMC3 and I added a layer of hierarchy on top, which allows you to basically say, these different time series are related, so they should also share some of their parameters, but maybe not entirely. Uh, if you're interested in it, there's a talk from either PyMCCon or PyData Jetta on YouTube, where I basically go through the entire library, um, how it's built, what my idea behind the API was, and behind building it in the first place. Cool. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Okay. Happy to be here. Great. Thanks. Okay, so the next step is actually the most important part of the presentations of today, and it's our participant presentation. So I would like to welcome the let's say the presenter from the first team, uh, Wally. It's your time to to turn on your microphone and start sharing your screen. And good luck, Wally. You're the first one, the most courageable person. Could I check whether this is OK? Um, it's not really OK, because we see only a picture, but uh, we don't see here? the whole. 
I think still not. What what we've seen right now, we've seen the capture.png. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Sorry, that's my only slide. Actually. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm from Philips and Lini's team. Uh, we merged the teams. And yeah, uh, with my group mates, we did the first task um, mentioned. And because uh, the whole process was already kind of mentioned upon, so maybe let me just jump into some small details of what we kind of did differently. So similarly, we trained the naive model as well as the linear regression model. However, for the linear regression model, we only added the fuller features and we uh, missed out on adding the lag features. And hence, our best performing model was actually the naive model. And hence, our results will also be that of the naive model. That's one. And Yes, so basically uh, we chose this model and then um, Olga trained um, the models and after that Tatiana started creating the batch pipeline for it. So um, instead of creating many batches, we, um, Tatiana actually chose just one week. Mm -hmm. So it was more of a, I would say, pilot to go through the whole process of building up the whole thing. And we chose the second last week of uh, the period of the data set. And Tatiana um, basically pushed this to Azure and then created the batch pipeline and created the predictions. And thereafter, uh, I used the predictions and I compare it to the solar wind prediction uh, which is the result that you see here. So the results from the model gives us predicted load, um, predicted demand of people. And if you can, um, maybe let me switch off my yeah. video. And if you can see here from the right-hand side graph, mm -hmm. there the fluctuation in predicted load isn't actually that much and because we use the naive model hence you can imagine that this was the load of the previous week so it's not adjusted for any sort of features um yeah but on in contrast energy production actually varies by quite a lot and you can see uh that for example in on 3 june and 4 june the energy uh, the predicted solar and wind um, energy levels are predicted to go down by a lot. And hence, even though when predicted demand stays roughly about the same, um, yeah, that people will still need to cut back on um, what they do with this electricity. And so on the right-hand side, uh, basically, we calculated the excess supply, which we calculate it to be predicted load minus the solar prediction and the wind prediction. And we chose some thresholds. So if excess supply is below zero, definitely uh, we need to start cutting back on uh, the demand. However, it's a bit risky to choose uh, when it's zero. So we chose a slightly higher cutoff, I think around 10 megawatts. And hence, that's the threshold that be if you fall, if the excess supply is predicted to fall below that, we recommend that people uh, stop uh, using electricity as much as possible. And um, Based on the excess supply, we also did some descriptive statistics and we were not so sure what to choose as a normal threshold. Uh, hence, we just chose something that was near, I think, the 50, 50th or 75th percentile of excess supply. Yeah. And so, yes, that was our process and that was our result. Great, thanks.
I'm just wondering if uh, you're talking about this day. So it's like the third and first June. Was it like Friday and sun uh, and uh, Sunday? Oh, sorry, Saturday. Oh, okay. Uh, I missed up on this point. So actually, yeah. we did make a mistake in the prediction, and hence, if you see, there's only six days here. Because okay. yeah, because on six June we actually uh, took the first. Uh, we took twelve a.m. and hence actually the last day's observation was missing, and hence here we truncated it as six days. And thirty first May is actually Monday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Yeah, nice. Thursday and Friday is where you see. Uh, where you really need to restrict supply. But then again, as you can see from the graph, it seems largely driven by the supply rather than the demand. Okay, okay, thanks. So far, congratulations of reaching out to this point and also on a good collaboration with your team. So let's say, um, we will see, we're going to give this to the Pytown inhabitants and we're going to see how the Pytown inhabitants are going to react to it, if it's clear for them how to use it. And uh, the reason, um, let's say, you you mentioned trash holes, great. And then you mentioned as well the uh, the trash holes that you put between, low, uh, between middle and normal, right? Yes. Yeah, between middle and normal. Okay, okay, good. Matthijs. Do you want to add something in it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I like the way that it's like it, it sounds like you, uh, yeah, you you nicely managed to work all the way through it. That's really cool. Managed to get all the components there. Um, I, I'm always curious about uh, what were some of the things that that you that you struggled with, maybe, or like that were harder than you first imagined them to be. I think the main thing was that uh, personally, I felt that I really lacked domain knowledge in this field of energy. So it took me some time uh, after uh, Ilona explained that I realized load wasn't uh, the generation of supply, but it was demand. And mm -hmm. also, even in the choice of thresholds, I think it, we kind I just chose it. Um, such that it falls within reasonable range of the data, but how we should choose the threshold, I think it has to be a bit more informed by, uh, for example, how much is feasible and uh, how much earlier you need to anticipate. And to me, 10 megawatts, I don't know what's the, I don't know what it means to people's lives. Yeah, so I feel like a lack of domain knowledge here, it, it can become a lot more intuitive if there was this domain knowledge. Yes. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, something I, I'd like to add there, maybe the threshold should could also be influenced by um, the expected performance of your model. And because there's probably, there's a there's a different trade-off between under predicting and over predicting in such a case, right? You don't want a blackout. That's the main thing we want to make sure that it doesn't happen. So if we know that our model is always that can be 15 megawatts watts off on a regular basis, then we might need to increase our threshold a bit. So we start That's warning true. people earlier. Um, but I, I completely understand your point. Uh, dealing without like making these things without domain knowledge is very hard. But good job, uh, like what I see. Yeah, the same, the same to me, because it's exactly when you just deep dive into completely unknown domain. And in this domain, you need to literally to make decisions which can enorm influence on the people lives, because it's about, OK, uh, can I just literally, sorry, use my fridge? It's like just one of the most probably important things, <laughs> over, overly underestimated, but important. And if there is literally no energy in grid, it means that you're not even allowed to use the fridge. So I'm not talking about, you know, uh, to warm up water or something like this, just like basic, basic needs. So yes, great job so far. Congratulations. And thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you. Cool. And I think now we can uh, gradually move into the next presenter. So I would like to ask uh, Klim 
to start sharing the screen. Unmute yourself. Yes, thank you, Elena. Um, yeah, a couple of words by myself. I'm Klim. I work full time as a machine learning data scientist, machine learning engineer, data scientist in Amsterdam. And I would like to present the results of our Capstone project on behalf of our star team, which had uh, yeah, two members, unfortunately, but also two mentors. It's kind of uh, nice. Yes. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. The, the goal of the project was, of course, to help Pytown citizens forecast their energy demand on a weekly and quarterly basis so that we can prevent uh, energy blackouts by helping them balance energy consumption and energy supply. And to do that, we managed to make uh, an end product as a dashboard to alert uh, citizens when they need to reduce their consumption and when they can fully uh, charge their devices as well. So the first step was to make a weekly batch monitoring dashboard. Uh, we did that by uh, averaging the daily demand prediction uh, to predict the, the daily average uh, demand uh, uh, consumption. We used this with a linear regression model that also used uh, Fourier features to capture the daily seasonality. We put that into the batch inference pipeline on Asia, which was scheduled every single week on Monday at 4 uh, a.m. Uh, European time. Uh, we used uh, around 700 data points, which were uh, split into batches for seven days to make uh, weekly predictions. And uh, for uh, classification of the demand KPI, uh, we used the uh, quantiles on the energy demand distribution. So we split the energy uh, demand distribution into three parts, and based on the thresholds, we estimated uh, what kind of charge uh, per day the citizens could achieve. And this is also shown here on the, on the dashboard on the right side. Uh, of course, uh, the weekly um, predictions, they are less accurate than near real-time predictions because of the uh, time windows. So we stepped further and we also managed to, to make a real-time monitoring dashboard or near real-time, I should say, because the prediction was made every 15 minutes. Uh, this time we used uh, naive, uh, naive uh, forecast uh, wrapped into the uh, block triggered Azure function so that every time the new data uh, came in a block storage, we could uh, immediately uh, trigger a new prediction for the next 15 minutes. And this time we also took uh, uh, energy supply into account uh, so that we could uh, estimate the difference uh, between the energy demand and energy supply. Of course, for the prediction, we still uh, don't have uh, energy supply predictions. So we used the running average for the past uh, hour to determine the difference between the average uh, supply and the predicted uh, energy demand. So that uh, we could also use the quantiles, three parts of the distribution to establish the KPI thresholds on the dashboard. And this is also shown on the right side on, uh, on the dashboard as well. So the lessons learned, uh, most of things were uh, during the uh, development and uh, deployment. Uh, yeah, we have to uh, deal with the uh, bad data as, as soon as possible, uh, rather than deploy as it is, because it, of course, can affect the model metrics. In our case, it was an uh, average percentage error. Um, of course, missing dependencies, they always play a role in the, in the working environments to, to make the pipeline work. So also an issue. Um, local testing, uh, especially with the uh, great tools like Azure 8, they're really helpful to first um, test and then put into production. Um, we spent lots of time thinking about the KPIs, how we could uh, predict and classify the KPIs. So business knowledge is really helpful there. 
and of course uh, collaboration and uh, discussions of uh, of the problems with others is it, it in most cases is really helpful because they almost always provide available suggestions and what we also learned that uh, mlops is uh, is really great for uh, uh, predicting and for uh, uh, use cases such as this one uh, yeah, so thank you everyone for attention. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Inga and uh, Dexter for providing this uh, practical use case. And of course, uh, Alona for, and other mentors for uh, making this uh, workshop possible. Okay, hey, thank you so much. I should say the dashboard's looking great. Imagine then we can then somehow embed this just small dashboard into the apps and just go while further to send in literally errors like stop charging or uh, go further right so yes. really cool to see how much you managed to achieve what i'm more ma wondering most so um, there was a lot of questions uh, regarding the use case there was a lot of questions about uh, for example back testing of the models what specifically for you was the uh, let's say the most interesting and new concept that you learned uh, during this bootcamp yeah, I think working with the time series data and also backtesting the model. I didn't have enough knowledge to uh, at the first uh, yeah, backtest uh, models properly. So I struggled a bit uh, at that part. Mm -hmm. um, but also I think the, the whole process, it was really interesting to build the whole process from, from uh, data exploration to the deployment. Uh, and see that the, the whole process, the, all, all of the steps are relevant and uh, uh, useful to build up the whole big picture of, uh, of uh, complete use case. Cool. And can I ask you to get back for a second for slide number four, where you have this real-time dashboards, like let, let's call it near real-time dashboards. Mm -hmm. Like why do you think uh, we explicitly ask to work with naive for a cast instead of, for example, using linear regression in this case. Just like any ideas. Well, the uh, because it's a near real time uh, monitoring, I think the the sliding window approach is already reliable because it's almost uh, yeah, near real time. So the information from the past 50 minutes is almost always good enough uh, to predict the next 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think linear regression would be just overkill for this 15 minutes sliding windows. Cool. And you know that the, the, the simplest thing was that uh, when we were working with linear regression, we were building uh, different features and we were including weather in it. So the weather and solar GHI, they were part of um, the features for linear regression. And in case I uh, was real, was, let's say near real time, we literally didn't have an opportunity to get this data on time. It means if we're not capable of getting this data on time, we're not going to do any predictions at all. So the just data is not there. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I think it's a really good example to see how and if you go more to the real time life settings, that's the case when machine learning is literally behind just simple business logic or just simple statistical calculations. So I think that's where you see the beauty of MLOps in action. So although you can have the best ever model, but if there is no data available to give the prediction, to get, receive predictions from this model, there is no way to use it. And Matthijs, what do you want to say about this? Um, yeah, well, once again, really, uh, really nice job. Um, it looks like you really got far, um, but there's probably also things that you didn't get around to, right? So let's say you had, this, you, you were at, this was your, your uh, company's use case. What would you say would be your next step? What would you focus on getting into place that you currently missed, maybe? Um, I didn't have enough time to optimize the model. Okay. So, yeah, this part I would work on. And maybe also work um, more uh, on uh, establishing right thresholds. 
Because, hmm. yeah, there were many ideas. One of them was, for instance, uh, trying k-means and classify uh, the difference between the supply and the consumption of the three groups. But this, of course, as an, an extra model, which also requires timely deployment and maintenance. So we went rather with the simple business rules. Yeah. So careful thinking about the right metrics and the right uh, thresholds requires, of course, domain knowledge and, and time. Yeah. Okay. So basically improving the model, improving your thresholds. Um, yes. did, you, did you spend any time on, on monitoring the entire system? I not not really. Okay. I I took a look in, in, into application size because I also recorded some logs there. Mm. Uh, at that time, model worked. Yeah, so was nothing nothing wrong with that. But in the long term, of course, it's really it's really important to monitor. Yeah, exactly. You want to sort of keep track of hey, what what kind of values did my model predict, and have those turned out to be anywhere good. Um, which poses an interesting problem because if everything works well, then people will look at this dashboard and will impact that will impact their energy usage. So your your dashboard is actually changing its own data for the future, which is an, an interesting problem to think about um, for these kinds of use cases. Yes, but also the data drip may affect the distributions of the difference of energy uh, demand, which would of course affect the threshold. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, and I think I also have a quick question. Uh, the last one, actually. So uh, there was some outliers. So what you actually, what the strategy uh, the team has chosen to deal with outliers? Yes, um, of course, because we are dealing with a, a mean percentage error. The out, we, we actually had some zero values uh, demand, and this would of course affect the MAP uh, metric. So instead of just uh, uh, removing these points or simply uh, um, using averages, I just took the the less known uh, values from uh, before the before the dropout, before the the zero value uh, demand. Because if we just I think if we just take the the overall average, we also we neglect the uh, seasonality part and also neglect the the fact that it the average gives the whole picture of the of, of the uh, the whole uh, the whole time series and not of this specific part which is uh, dependent on the season and dependent on the on the daily pattern so we went rather with uh, the latest known value rather than the whole average Okay, cool. Thanks so much. Uh, once again, for courage, for presentation, and to see that you went so far. And I should say the dashboard also looks really great. Uh, I would rather use it as well. So and it's like low charts, really colorful. You see immediately. So stop doing things that you're doing right now. Thanks again. Thank and you. now it's time to prepare for Katerina. Um, hi everyone, my name is Katarina uh, and I work for a fintech startup uh, in Sweden, um, which, is, um, which is a comparison platform for corporate financing. And here's uh, my presentation, our teams. Uh, is it visible? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, this is the presentation for the Capstone project. And um, as you all know, uh, here are the uh, structure of the presentation. Uh, first, I'm going to quickly go over about the task, then the implementation details of the first and the second tests, and main challenges and takeaways. Uh, so uh, the main goal uh, of this project was to help inhabitants of Pytown, the Netherlands city to produce to, uh, that produces its own energy, help to adjust their electricity demand to the electricity generation. Um, 
And uh, the main goal for the first task was to provide a daily forecast for the upcoming week for the inhabitants of the Pi Town. Um, with regards to the data processing steps, uh, the decision was made to treat the only existing outlier, which was substituted with a mean value, as linear models are known to be very sensitive to them. Uh, here you may find it depicted on the plot. On the plot, uh, the main presumption was that that um, due to the sensor error, but either way, I th we think that the further further investigation should be performed um, during development of the next and improvement of this model. Uh, the uh, the low data was merged with the weather data in order to improve forecast accuracy as well as um, for year features uh, based on quarter quarterly holiday and workday pattern were added in order to capture seasonality as well as lack features uh, that showed themselves to be very good um, were added to the model. Um, Moving on to the training and evaluation part. Um, the main method was used sliding window approach and models were optimized for MAPI. Um, final model was back tested again against naive model, which consisted of a one week lag. Um, the, the comparison is in the plot, uh, in the uh, top most plot. Uh, uh, results, uh, main model performed twice as good as the naive model, um, and all features were supported during uh, recursive feature elimination cross-validation. And uh, the resulting plot you may uh, see at the bottom. As for the deployment part, uh, a pipeline was deployed to the Azure, um, and here we can see the details of the deployed pipeline. Uh, unfortunately, due to deployment issues, we were not able to connect output to the Power BI. Uh, with that said, it didn't stop us and we continued working on the forecast improvement and moved on to the second task, um, which goal was to provide a more, more detailed and timely forecast to solve the issue of black, blackout in Python. Uh, here, um, here, the model was trained on 15 minutes frequency data, and unfortunately, weather data was unavailable for this timing. So we used lagged features, as with the model in the first task, as well as one hot encoded features with quarter, holiday, and workday data. Uh, during RFACV, only one feature was dropped, which was um, the lagged load feature, um, which basically gives us an idea that uh, all almost all the features were import important, and you can see the detailed plot in the bottom. Uh, the trained model was deployed as an Azure blob trigger function. Uh, outputs uh, persisted to the blob storage um, and um, to the file named prediction CSV, to which uh, the Power BI dashboard was connected. Um, here you can see the actual dashboard um, and the output prediction. Um, unfortunately, in our team, we had no one who uh, who could work on the actual dashboard, so. This is like the first version of it. Um, um, as uh, we found later in the project uh, that wind and solar predictions should be used in order to classify the load. That's to say about the domain knowledge, which I didn't have before. Um, which is not um, the case with the current preprocessing step. So as you can clearly see in the graph, the production of energy is very volatile. So one, day, one day's consumption may be low for one day and high for the other, which leaves room for further improvement in the part of the data post-processing. 
So uh, other main things that should have be should should be improved is basically restructure and improve the code, uh, fix the pipeline part, um, mainly the scheduling, uh, improve uh, post processing, uh, build a better dashboard, and uh, further implement test uh, tests and a model monitoring setup. Um, with regards to main challenges and takeaways, uh, the, the main challenges were to deploy and schedule the pipeline and uh, connect it to the, um, to the Power BI. And, uh, and if, uh, when trying to do that, I found that uh, even uh, when the predictions on the plop storage were um, updated, uh, like uh, each time the dashboard was not updated, like up to date with that. Um, and the takeaways uh, is that always leave enough room for the deployment because you may have the best model but not have enough time to deploy it. So it, for the first deployment, it has to be good enough. Um, managing cost is also very important because uh, with cloud deployments, there is a lot of cost that can be incurred. And you also need to take that into account and that MLOps is an iterative process. Uh, so we will improve on the um, on what we haven't done before in the round next. Uh, overall, uh, I think the project was a great opportunity to learn by doing, which gave an in-depth understanding of batch and real-time model cloud deployment uh, with all its important details uh, starting from the very business understanding till testing and monitoring. Uh, this is the end of my capstone presentation. Thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you so much. Great. It's also nice to hear that uh, although there were some issues, uh, you managed to, um, to, let's say, to try both deployments. Um, I completely agree with the idea that MLOps is an iterative process, so it's really hard to say it's not a waterfall approach where you say, okay, we're going to do this, at this stage we deliver this, at this stage we deliver that. In real life, you learn a lot of, uh, let's say, ups and downs, that the data is not available, the data is not available in the format that you expected, the data is not, the data is available in the format that you expected, but something wrong with this data anyway. So. Uh, let's say if you get a chance uh, to um, redo the whole experience again, imagine that just we just right now uh, stepping in into the time travel machine and you can get back to the day when we just announced the capstone. I was wondering in this way how you're going to actually um, split your workload between team members and also um, what will be the most uh, areas to focus on to make sure that you have at least a yeah like a working prototype uh, at the end of the iteration mm, one of the main uh, challenges and uh, things that uh, our team encountered is that um we started working on the project uh, getting our first meeting uh only a week after the capstone uh, started. So basically, uh, one of the things is, was that we didn't have enough time. So for the development of this project was only like a, a week. So um, if I were if I were to divide tasks between uh, team members, uh, and also one of the things uh, was like we didn't uh none of our team members knew how to uh work uh wh when we had different azure accounts and uh, working with git uh, was uh, also difficult for some of our members so it, it, the question on how to merge and how to combine work was also an issue for us but I should say that if taking into account the fact that it was only one week instead of two and a half weeks spent on it is just tremendous results, literally, and you should be proud of it with what you achieved so far. Uh, I also noticed that um, during the 
Teach engineering process, you decided to go a little bit far and to add lagged features, and uh, it was just for the reason of improving the model, or what was the reason behind these steps? Um, uh, when uh, trying the first model, the one that was like the daily, uh, I noticed that uh, for the first one I trained the models, I was very like the the baseline model performed twice as better than the the actual model so you add for your features and then you get a worse model than just the lagged feature so i thought like why why not add lagged features like uh you did in uh the uh in the lessons um and during the second model uh, i thought that i if i cannot use the weather data why not i just leave the lagged features as well as the uh, holiday and uh, other data that's used for the for year features, but just one hard and code it and see what will happen. Okay, so the power of feature engineering in action, you will take up the most simple, stupid, rudimentary model and just with the power of feature engineering, you can get the performance that will outperform the most sophisticated state-of-the-art models. Good job, really good job. <laughs> Thanks. Matthijs? Um, yeah, I can only sort of uh, agree with uh, with really good job. Um, also, with your statement that it's an iterative process, I always, when I when I teach machine learning operations, I, I use this quote from, I think it's the LinkedIn founder or something, that if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, then you launch too late. <laughs> um, and I, I think there's some truth in that, right? The first version should be the, the, the simplest, easiest thing you can imagine that, that works. Uh, and then you iterate and get that end-to-end -end thing running and then uh, yeah, go from there. Um, yeah, you, you, you thought a bit about monitoring, I saw. You had one of your, like one of your next steps was, okay, we want some better monitoring. And I already, uh, we briefly discussed it with Klim. Did you have something specific in mind or was it still a very open uh, open uh, question? Like the monitoring. Like, yeah, the, yeah, the monitoring of the model and, and its performance. And... Um, I didn't have something specific. Okay, just in general, we need to monitor, but uh, not sure need, why. We you? need to monitor the data drift. We need yeah. to make tests for the data uh, for the actual model, but... <laughs> That's, that's yeah, it's it's always yes. It's, monitoring is always one of those things that uh, yeah is easy to overlook because well it's working now so uh, other things to do but yeah. I think for one week probably yeah, if oh, they will focus on monitoring yeah. as well. Then they will <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> There's no way that that fits in a week. I uh, think good job. I think, you know, the monitoring, it could be like a separate boot camp and oh, it sure. could be, you know, like three months long and we will not manage to cover just the basics. I don't know, like the data drift for categorical, uh, for example, data drift for categorical features, data drift for numerical features yeah. and all these things. Uh, yeah, thanks um, a lot, Katrina. Great job. And now it's time for uh, the next team to present. Uh, so, Dania, uh, if I pronounce your name correctly, and Hassan. Um, you can start sharing your screen and presenting. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Aliona. Um, I will share the screen and we are going to present together. Okay. So our team also started working on the project uh, nine days ago. So we, we were even chatting yesterday that at the end, it felt more like a hackathon because we wanted to finish and have something to present. Uh, here is something about us. So my name is Dania. I am a data scientist. I am based in Berlin. And I have worked mostly with the part of um, the models, so training models. And I did some deployment, but I never uh, did it on the cloud. So that was the main motivation for me to join the bootcamp. Hassan, would you like to say? Yeah. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Hassan, and I'm a part-time data scientist. And my background is physics. Uh, I'm working here in Chemnitz in the eastern part of Germany. And my work is focused mainly on making predictive analysis and delivering insights based on ML models and to deploy them 
on mini cloud services like Heroku or some others. So this was my main motivation also to learn about uh, Microsoft Azure. Yes, and um, our mentor, Mate, we really want to thank you for all the support. Like uh, the way we work it together was uh, pretty cool. We got to learn a lot. I want to uh, briefly say some words about our approach. So similar to uh, what you were just saying now in the previous presentation, our goal was to finish um, and do some iterations. So we wanted really to do an end-to-end -end, uh, with the first task, which is to do the batch prediction using an IE forecast. And then the approach would be to iterate on this end-to-end -end skeleton, but changing the model. In the end, we didn't have time to iterate on the model, but we did got some results with the naive forecast. So this is what I'm going to present. Uh, one of the things that we started with was um, we had three data sets to work with, but we ended up working with only two of them. So the energy load, which represented the consumption of the city, and then the wind and solar predictions that was the energy that was generated. And to make our lives easier, also we aggregated it uh, on a daily basis. Since for this batch um, processing, the idea was to forecast for the day. So our naive forecast is an average consumption for the same day of the week, considering previous weeks. So for example, uh, for tomorrow Sunday, we would look at two, three, or four previous Sundays, and we would take the average. So in that way, we were trying to also capture uh, some weekly seasonality. And the evaluation, uh, we did the backtest and we optimized it for the mean average uh, of precision error. Then we deployed our uh, best performing model, which is uh, the next slide I will show you. And we developed, uh, deployed it, sorry, as the machine learning batch pipeline model. And after we had that prediction of consumption, we compared it with the energy generation from both the wind and solar predictions. And we classified it between normal, middle, or low charge and persisted the results to the Azure blob storage. And we managed to connect the blob storage uh, from the cloud to the local Power BI to have uh, some dashboards to show to the inhabitants of PyTown. So some of the challenges that we had to deal with, um, the first one is that we did not register our input data set on the cloud. So we could upload it to the blob storage, but um, we skipped or we didn't realize that we hadn't registered it as a data set. So when we were training the models, it could not find it. And we didn't know why, because we could see it on the blob storage. But then we learned that you have to upload it to the blob storage and then also register it as a tabular data set, which was how we um, registered it in the machine learning part. Then uh, we were able to develop the model. We had everything uh, uploaded, but um, it was not working out. So we were able to start the pipeline, the experiment pipeline, but um, yeah, somehow our input was different than what was expected. We had some data frames with indexes and when we had the data set that was registered on the cloud that didn't have index, so we were a bit confused. Um, it took us some time to learn also how to read the logs on the cloud, but we managed it also, again, with the help of our mentor and a lot of um, like changing the windows and sharing the windows and like really doing this together. So one of the things that I really enjoyed also is um, we got to work a lot together. We shared the screen and we looked at it together. So we helped each other to find problems. Um, our output was also a bit challenging because it had to be either a list or a data frame. Otherwise, it was not accepted. And the length of the list or the data frame had to be a specific length that matched the input. So after we figured that out, um, we were able to persist our results. And to connect, um, what happened is that I was running on my cloud account, and that's where it was persisted. And we wanted Hassan to access it from his computer on Power BI. 
So there were a few tricks, like how to learn, learning how to give access to another person on my cloud account. Now well, here is just one slide to say that this was our forecast. So we took, uh, here you can see an example. So looking at previous two weeks to calculate the average, uh, zero is Sunday, one is Mon Monday, two is Tuesday, for example. So the first two weeks, we don't have any forecast. And then on the third week, we can look back at the two previous, for example, Tuesdays to have the average for the Tuesday that is about to come. And then we, this is one example. We did this for different uh, windows. And this is the results of the MAP. So we have here looking back one week or two weeks or three weeks and so on. We can see here that the lowest one is the fifth week. But we decided in the end to go with uh, three, looking at previous three weeks only because the difference in MAPE is too little that it's not worth missing a week's prediction, right? Because if we choose the fifth one, that means that for the fourth four weeks, we wouldn't have anything to predict or anything to show to you know, in the dashboard. So yeah, our best model, the one that we went uh, forward with is the one that has the MAPE of 26.5%. And this is how it looks like. So in red, we have our predicted energy consumption. And in blue, we have the actual consumption. Yeah, so um, I'll take from here. So we can see that uh, the usage of energy, the, the difference in predicted energy consumption and the total ge energy generated. And we can see that the usage of energy is pretty wild and very uncertain over the years. So there are days where the total is lower than the energy consumed by the Pythoners. So we can see that uh, when we take the difference of the two. Uh, next, please. So we classified the energy class based on this box plot uh, where we uh, took uh, anything lower than zero as low charge and any, anything um, above the second and the third quartile as medium charge and anything above that as a, as a normal charge. Uh, and that's how we classified it. So, and we call it zero, one, and two, uh, as you can see here. So uh, this is the first time for us to use Power BI and for the given limited time we had. This is the only fancy dashboard we came up with. And here we say the usage of uh, the energy for the month of January 2021 and, and the days where the energy class is 0, 1, and 2. We can see them on the left, uh, on the y-axis. And we see some days we have blackouts and some days there is enough charge. Yeah. So next. So uh, next we would like to explore or like to find um, to work and to get our understanding in making the blob storage uh, naming convention clear for us. So like, if, if for example, if we are working with multiple projects, then we want to know which storage belongs to which project. Um, then we like to improve on writing different tests or like unit tests and also make a good documentation for us to be able to follow quickly. So like whenever we return to our code or the project, it's clear to follow like, like out of the box or like a product, um, just few clicks and the, set, the the setup is ready. Yeah, and Daniel like to add two cents to this slide maybe? Yes, yeah. uh, we also didn't have the chance to schedule this pipeline. So we did uh, run the pipeline on the cloud. It took us a few runs to make it work and we finally made it work uh, last evening but we didn't publish it and schedule it. So the idea was also to make it uh, run once a week, right? So we didn't have the chance to play with that. And also we didn't have the chance to try out the near real-time inference. So to have that, um, that it's triggered automatically every 15 minutes when there is a new input data. This is what we would like to explore next. Yes, and I think this is it for us. Thanks. And also, can I ask you to go back, for example, to to the um, sharing your screen? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I would highly appreciate if you just share uh, the first pair of slides. Um, we literally missed some of the slides before, so I just want to make sure that the slides are there. Uh, yeah, and and the, the before, the, the slide before as well. Yes, so thanks. That's to make sure that these slides are in the presentation as well. Okay, so that's this slide and the next slide, there were the slides uh, that, uh, yeah, due to some GC peculiarities, they were not picking up uh, for the rest as well. Uh, first of all, also, okay. yeah, thanks uh, for the great job. Um, it's nice also to hear that although you said, okay, we're not going to manage to to do this, at least you managed to do the first step. The part that it was not scheduled, it's not a big deal because it's just like the extra, let's say, pair lines of code. But for now, at least if you have a working pipeline, you can iterate on it further. And that's the goal because iteration is the key word, I think, in any type of development. It doesn't matter what type of development it is, right? So uh, what I'm more, more wondering about, um, I, if you get back to the dashboard, so it's, it's not necessary to share the slides. So um, I understood completely that the Power BI was completely new for you. It's a completely new tool. You need to learn, you know, like all the, let's say, uh, what to do with it. Um, I'm just wondering, so um, the first version of, of this dashboard, um, when you show this, let's say, like the graphic, how do you expect just to let people from PyTown to read it? So they should look at it and if they see zero, it says do nothing or what kind of behavior are you going to expect to get from this dashboard? Yeah, initially we wanted to have a, a, a like a dot scatter plot, but uh, this was the quickest we could make. Mm -hmm. um, so of course, um, we would expect the Pythoners to uh, 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 see, like, uh, uh, just figure it out. Uh, if it is, uh, if the line is above zero or at zero or one, then it's it's a go signal. And if it is uh, dead down, then they should stop yeah okay so in this sense okay so everything that's yeah. zero okay don't charge and, and if you see yeah. like if it's yeah. really really high it means that like if it's on top then you can do everything you want and if yes. it's somewhere in the middle it's like the medium usage right yeah, yeah. okay okay no sounds sounds good enough okay um Matthijs? um yeah, it's always hard to come up with questions if you if you worked on it uh, <laughs> oh, together, yeah. right? Oh, right. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, no worries. I just wanted to say, I, I, well, yeah, given the time that uh, we all spent on this, I think uh, I think it turned out really nicely, and I'm also really happy with indeed the way that that we work together, um, tackling this in in pair programming rather than splitting up and everyone doing their own part. I think is uh, it's just a nice way to go. Yeah. Okay. Then... So thanks. Okay, okay, okay. So l l let's keep let's keep biases away. So then uh, I will continue asking questions. Um, I think it's a question for both of you. Um, not for you, Matthijs, though. Um, so what for you personally, what was the, the big, the, the most, let's say, aha moments during this, during the whole process? Let's say top pick up top three uh, for you and also for Hassan top three. Okay. So I think the first aha moment was when we realized how to read the data because we had those three CSVs and we were thinking that the solar and wind predictions were something that we also would use in the naive model. But then we learned, okay, what we are trying to predict is the consumption and the solar and wind, they are the generation of the energy. So that was when uh, it became a lot more clear what was that we were trying to solve. And then the second part was when we were uh, working on the deployment on the cloud and it was running. In the beginning, it was taking a lot of time. And I was like, when we did this in the lessons, like the lessons that you did, Aliona, the stuff that you deployed, it they were like quick, you know, maybe not even 10 minutes. And mine was running for like 15, 20 minutes. And then I was with Hassan on the line and we were like, yeah, let's stop it. And we were like trying to open all the logs and figure out where we could read what was happening until we could really find uh, our way into the logs and we found the error logs. And that was also the aha moment. Okay, 
and then uh, we also had um, the orientation that we should okay try to print something maybe we can see uh, what is it that we are having there as the data um, yeah that also helped a lot and after understanding the logs and knowing how to fix the problems that we were having that really that was what made us make it to the end let's say great and Hassan for you uh, yeah for me um... I was struggling to understand, um, not, not struggling, but uh, not finding where to spend my time most, uh, whether on the pre-processing or to get feature engineering. But then I realized that the basic naive model is as good as um, any model. Then why, why waste time on that one? Um, so I just uh, had difficult time orienting my mind where to focus on. Uh, secondly, to uh, use Microsoft Azure. Um, it's my first time to use, so it took a time for me to uh, navigate and to be acquainted to it. Um, and also, um, I was looking for best practices whether to use um, uh, Azure through um, through um, uh, client, Clay, Clay, or to uh, just use the web interface of um, Azure. Um, so some things I could not get it done through uh, the command prompt and so I would have to do it manually from the website, from the uh, portal Azure. Uh, that's what I struggled and learned. Yeah. Um, yeah, these are the two things I could think of, yeah. Okay. Um, and if I get back to uh, the whole story, so um, the requirements were pretty fuzzy in the beginning. So we were not giving you any thresholds. We were not giving you any clear, uh, let's say, understanding of what the expectations We just say to you deploy. And that's the issue that you see coming really often uh, in the, let's say, especially enterprise scenario when the team just received something and they say deploy it without any explanations how, um, and the most difficult part, indeed, is in the monitoring. And if you're you are not working on the specific model, it's hard to understand exactly what kind of metrics should be monitored. So um, we were literally, let's say, like expecting some specific questions. But I assume that everyone was so focused on getting the things done until the end. So let's say, uh, what's actually, let's say. Probably it's a really direct question, but anyway, I will ask it. What prevents you from asking questions outside of your group? So to get in literally all this clarification about trash holds, about because you can get you can get all these clarifications if you just ask. Yes, you're right. I think that the issue was more of what to ask. You no, know? like at the beginning, we were just trying to get it all in and it was hard to even break it down into questions. So I think that was um, where our mentor really helped a lot because then we asked him a lot of questions <laughs> or we were just showing him, you know, like we don't understand this or we don't know where to start or yeah, it was a bit overwhelming in the beginning. Hassan and for you? Yeah, I didn't uh, like what to ask and the questions were pretty broad so it wasn't narrowed down. So also didn't want to. Uh, I know um, I, I, some questions like I um, I could figure it out. I wanted to figure it out on my, on my own. Um, uh, that's what I enjoy. But then I realized, okay, it's better to just uh, ask. But it was too late then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But in this case, what I just want to say, it's not about uh, blaming somebody else, it's not about like telling you what are the missing opportunities. It's more like a caution for everyone that if you work on a time box project, uh, try literally start with creating literally a list of questions. Although they were really, really big at the beginning, then probably you can further narrow it down like a funnel. And then from this funnel, literally find a person probably responsible for this task to ask this direct question because usually a lot of time literally wasted on doing something that you think is good what you're doing without understanding all requirements properly or in this like in this situation the requirements were pretty fuzzy once again i will emphasize on it 
So like nobody asked like what are the thresholds? How are we gonna split this? What what does it mean low? What does it mean medium? What does it mean high? Like nobody asked. It was really really interesting to to notice as well. And then if you can time box this, and uh, I know that everyone wants to do the best, uh, their own best. But if we make a small step back and just like okay, what we got, what we want to achieve, what are the steps? What are the questions? And from these questions, just getting back, okay, so probably this is what we can ask. That's 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 okay. We can, uh, let's say, find out on our own. And I'm also curious to hear the opinion of Matthias, like from your own uh, practice, like you're working mm -hmm. so many times, you're training so many people, like what piece of advice you want to share? Just in general? In general, yeah. Let's let's be as fuzzy oh. as possible. <laughs> um, I, I think it's it's related to your topic, but what I what I often think is the most important thing when it comes to let's say machine learning type problems, or I, I actually any type of IT problem, is is think in the system. Um, don't think about your model. Don't think about at first. Don't think about your model. Don't think about specific details, but think about where does the thing that I'm doing fit into this entire system. What is the processes that it's going to impact and, and how will it impact those? Right. In in this situation where we have this Python thing, we, we expect that our model will will change humans' behavior uh, in terms of what energy they will use, which is the thing that we're trying to predict in the first place. So how are we going to, for example, take that into account when we're going to evaluate how our model does? Right? Those are not things that you think of when thinking about only a model, but you have to take into account the entire the entire thing. And that's something that's missed very often in sort of the, the enthusiasm of starting something um, and, and the enthusiasm of solving a technical issue, whereas yeah, maybe that's not maybe that's not needed or maybe that's not the right right way to go uh, at all in the first place. Yeah, I can really relate to it. It's like really, really gold words because in our case, yeah. we're building the task was not to, uh, we, we call it like deploy model and bash, deploy model real time. But the people who live in the fight town, they don't care about all this AI stuff at no. all. They just want to have something to something reliable to understand, okay, can I do everything I want tomorrow? Or I need to a little bit like to to hold on and just to wait until like the next day is coming and probably yeah. there will be more windy or like more sun is coming, something like this. Yeah. But but also if people see that they can't charge their car tomorrow, will they charge more today and then cause problems today? Yeah. Right? There's all these these weird interactions that you that you have to sort of think about and deal with. Yeah, I do agree. Cool. Uh, first of all, congratulations to all of you who made it as finals. Um, tomorrow, the mentors will be given a written feedback to your GitHub repository. So well done. And I'm wondering, Bumika, do we have any questions to participants, actually? Um, we do have one question from Inga. I think it was after mm. Wally's presentation. Okay. So uh, she asked, do you expect that looking at a longer period in time would affect the thresholds between low, middle, and normal? And if yes, what would be the effect? I think it's a really, really great question. Uh, but I'm not sure that what is still with us, right? Um, Let me just check briefly. No, she's not on the presentation. OK, oh. OK. Oh, yeah, because she asked that she can um, yeah, leave earlier. I'm just wondering, do you, anybody from the presenters want to pick up this question? And we can repeat it if it's needed. I can try. Yeah. Oh. Bumika, can you repeat then the question again? And clean yeah. again. Yeah. Uh, right, so the question is, do you expect that looking at a longer period in time would affect the thresholds between low, middle, and normal? If yes, what would be the effect? Yes, I think uh, I do expect the change because citizens would adjust their behavior and their charge based on the results, the predictions they see on the dashboard. So I would assume that the difference between supply and chain will slightly move uh, to zero in the long run, in, in any case. 
so we would uh, see less and less the the red sign on the dashboard, I guess. So the distribution, would, the different distribution, would narrow down. So literally, we will re-educate people how to properly use the energy taken into account, seasonality taken into like the the, the whole uh, the whole story um, that we have, right? Exactly. Okay, cool. Uh, anybody else who wants to add something to it? Okay, Vumika, do we have any other questions? On the chat, so far, no. Okay. But um, this is for the participants, if for the audience, rather, if you have any questions, now is a good time to drop it in the chat and we'll probably wait for two, three minutes to see if there are any questions. Yes. Um, yep. Okay. I think we can even wait like for one or two minutes because we finished a little bit earlier today than we planned. So it's a great job as well sometimes to finish earlier, right? So we have more time for inter iterations. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, cool. And if, uh, let's say, I think if any questions coming up from our participants, we can actually redirect these questions to the Slack chat. So we can do this. Um, yeah, and for those who is watching, uh, I think it could be just asked. Uh, we are fun finding us um, on the internet. I think we can do as simple as that, right? Yes. So I think what we can do, we can conclude our session for today. So any questions, just go back to the Slack. And the next and final step of our bootcamp will be to uh, give a written feedback to the delivered GitHub repositories of the participants. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much for delivering this presentation today. Matthijs, thank, thank you for support. And, yeah, no problem. And Vumika as well. I think it can conclude our session and we can stop the stream.